All right, I've uh, started the webinar now and people should start streaming in soon. It's great that you're doing this like right after Unicure because then people can compare the differences between the two approaches. A little bit, yeah. although we're not talking directly about our therapy, so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, I think we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes for more people to stream in. Sometimes the sessions go over. Yes. All right, I think people are starting to stream in slowly so we can get going and more people will join as we go forth. So I think Dr. Fine, um, you can take it away. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mustafa. And uh, thank you to the HDO for inviting us to be with you today. Um, I wish we could all have been together in Scotland. Um, it is one of my favorite places and I was very much looking forward to being there and sharing um, this great meeting with all of you. Um, I wanna to talk to you today about uh, developing gene therapies for CNS diseases um, and disorders. And um, before we get started with that, just a little bit of an update um, for us from Voyager. So we are working to develop AAV gene therapies uh, for people with severe neurological diseases and what I have here is our pipeline. So these are the different uh, gene therapies that we are working to develop across a wide spectrum of diseases, all focused on uh, neurology, mostly CNS diseases. Um, as you can see here with our Huntington's disease, we are still just at that transition point between where we're doing our preclinical research and where we can actually get into the clinic and start testing our therapy in people. Um, as many of you may have seen in the news, we did file with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for what's called an investigational new drug um, clearance to start testing our drug. And we were put on what's called a clinical hold because of some chemistry manufacturing um, or CMC um, issues with our filing. This is not uncommon and we are working diligently to get that hold lifted so that we can move forward with our clinical program. So what I wanna to do today though, is talk to you about how we actually go about developing one of these AAV gene therapies that we are testing in, um, we want to test in people with Huntington's disease. Um, you will, may, many of you may have just heard from the Unicure team and they are also looking at an AAV gene therapy and they are in clinical trials testing that therapy in Huntington's. So just to give a little bit of an overview um, about uh, gene therapy, these therapies have been in clinical testing since the 1980s, although there was a great gap after a single, um, a single trial when there was a, a death of one of the patients. And there's been an enormous amount of advance since that time in uh, gene therapies. And these gene therapies work by providing a genetic material um, two cells that may help to treat the disease. So this is a very different approach to treating disease than what we've had in the past. Um, a broad range of, of treatments can be designed depending on the genes that are used. And for central nervous system diseases, there's the possibility that those benefits of the therapy may be long-term 
if we put these gene instructions, and I'll go through in just a minute how that works, into cells that have stopped dividing. So once the cells don't divide, or if we put it in cells that have never divided, it has the opportunity to stay there and continue working for a very long period of time. So I just wanna give a little bit of overview about how genes work um, and how we get from DNA to protein. So our DNA and our cells contain genes and these are the blueprints or instructions for making proteins. And proteins are the things that cells need to function. So throughout our bodies, we have a number of different proteins that are used to help our cells do what needs to be done to keep us alive and to keep all of our organs working. In order to do this, the DNA is what's called transcribed or um, transitioned into an RNA. And that's the template that the cell actually used to translate that DNA information into the protein. So it goes from DNA to RNA to a protein. And gene therapies work by potentially providing cells with additional DNA blueprints, so new instructions, which they can then use to make new DNA, either a, I'm sorry, new RNA, either RNAs that are already there, or sometimes we wanna put in an RNA that stops a protein from being made. And that's the strategy that's being used for Huntington's disease. So just to give a little bit of an overview of um, how this all works, the way we like to think about it is, is a, a, we think about gene therapies as a message, again, that's being coded into DNA. So genes code a message into DNA. And then that DNA uses the cell's natural machinery to make a drug. And so how does this work? Well, we have a message and that's that DNA sequence containing the gene that we want to then do something in the cells. We have to deliver that message somehow. And so we put that message into an envelope and the envelope we use is a gene um, it's packaged into what's called a vector. And the envelope that we use is that AAV. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. We then have to deliver that. So just like you would deliver a letter, you put a very specific address on it. And in this case, we again use a targeted delivery that's very similar to what Unicure is doing, except that we are targeting slightly different brain structures than Unicure is, but our delivery is directly into the brain. And then once those instructions are received, the cell uses that gene to produce the treat. Okay, so again, just to um, review, the DNA is gonna act like a blueprint or the instructions that the cell uses to make RNA. And again, it's that RNA that makes the proteins. We're putting that message into an envelope or a vector, which is a combination of the DNA that's being delivered, so this new message, and a capsid or the envelope that helps it enter the cells. And the AAV is one type of capsid and it's the capsid that we are using um, in our um, therapies that we develop. It then gets delivered. So the vector has to be delivered so that it can get to the target cells. And then those cells that receive the gene can use the DNA to make the treatment within the cells. So there's, multiple different factors that go into developing a gene therapy. And these are the things that scientists need to make sure that they are thinking about so that the gene therapies that they develop can be specific and, and work in the diseases that they're targeting. So the first thing we have to understand is the gene and the cell that we're trying to target with our gene therapy. We also have to think about how the gene therapy will be administered and what type of capsid and what type of gene design are we going to use so that again, it can get to the right cells and work in those cells. So all of these things work together when developing a gene therapy. And there's a number of different ways, for example, that you can deliver a gene therapy. One is directly into the brain tissue and we often call this interparenchymal. You can also, um, the gene therapy into brain fluids, and this can be called intracerebroventricular. That's a big word to say on a Sunday afternoon. 
And we can also put it into spinal fluids or intrathecal fluids here in the spine, which we've heard some talk about today from Roche and Wave. And then when we think about what the capsid is, capsid or the AAV in this instance is a protein shell of AAV and inside that protein shell, and there's a number of different one protein shells out there in the world, we put the therapeutic gene and then we have these little things on the ends that are called inverted terminal repeat, repeats. And these package that gene and help to tell it where to go and where to express itself, where it should work, what kinds of cells it should work in. And we also have some other what are called regulatory elements that are around that therapeutic gene, which again, help to tell it where it should work. Okay, so how do medicinal genes work? Well, there's a number of different things that they can do. First and foremost, there's gene replacement. And so this is what happens when you add a gene um, to tell cells that the cells have lost. So this would happen when there's a missing protein, when there's a missing gene in somebody's, um, in somebody's DNA that they need to function normally. What would happen is, is you can put this gene into cells to start producing that missing protein. There's also gene reduction, and this is something that you might do when you add a gene that lowers the amount of uh, protein made. This is often called RNA interference. So this is one of the techniques that's used for gene therapy. Um, and what the, um, the technique that Voyager is working to develop for uh, gene therapy for Huntington's disease. And what this does is it reduces the amount of protein um, that is being created by a gene that is either creating a protein that's not working the way it's supposed to or too much of that protein. You can also have gene supplementation, and this is when you put in a new therapeutic protein, um, either in cells that didn't used to make it or in an area of the body that didn't used to make it. And this is actually the approach that Voyager is taking in its Parkinson's disease program. Okay, so let's get back to the adeno-associated virus or the AAV, which is that package that we use, the capsid that we use to deliver gene therapy. So most importantly, AAVs are not known to cause any illness. They're actually non-infectious. They don't multiply. Those of you who um, have had uh, basic high school biology, you may have learned during that time that the thing that viruses do best is replicate, replicate, replicate. They just make themselves all over the place. But AAVs don't do that. So they, they aren't naturally replicating. They actually need something else to help them in order to replicate. They also don't, aren't known to merge with the natural DNA that's in cells. So they're what's called non-integrating. So they don't integrate with the um, genes of the cells that they are trying to make medicines in. And as I noted earlier, in cells that don't divide, like neurons, which are in your brain, they may work for a very, very long time. When it comes to the immune system, um, it tends to have a very mild response to AAVs, although most people have been exposed to AAVs. And there's many types that occur naturally, and each of those different types has different, pro uh, different properties. And when we talk about different AAVs, we talk about AAV serotypes. So if you were at the Unicure talk just a few minutes ago, you will have heard them talk about AAV5. And that five refers to a specific serotype of AAVs. And for example, with Voyager, the program that we're working to develop for Huntington's disease is an AAV1 serotype. So what that means is that it has slightly different attributes on its shell on its outer envelope, and that that what then affects how it moves around in cells and what cells it likes to cling to and enter. So those different serotypes, as I just alluded to, um, have different what are called different tropisms, and this is what allows them to enter different types of cells. They also have different serotypes also have the ability to travel within and across cells in different ways from the site of treatment. 
Now, one of the things we know is that most serotypes can't cross the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier is just this network of cells that protects your brain from things like viruses entering it. Because of course, we want to protect our neural system and our brain system as much as possible from outside elements. Now, interestingly, while there are a number of what are called wild type AAV serotypes, you can also engineer new serotypes if they're needed. And you can engineer these new serotypes to have different um, attributes um, than the ones that already exist. And there's a number of different companies that are working to engineer different types of AAVs so that they can better um, work in diseases um, that they are trying to target. So inside the AAV capsid, we have the therapeutic, what's called the therapeutic transgene. So we have to design that therapeutic transgene to put it into that AAV package, that AAV capsid. And I told you before that we had the ITRs or the inverted terminal repeats, and those are on each end. And then we also talked a couple about the regulatory elements. And those are right here, these genome replications, the replicating elements. And then the capsid protein elements are right here. And it's this capsid protein element that actually carries all the genetic code for the AAV. And so the AAVs contain um, a code for replication and then the capsid. And then they also have, as I just said, the internal, the ITRs at both ends. And the ITRs help assemble the AAV excuse me, the AAV vector and keep the therapeutic gene stable once it gets inside the cells. The rep and the cap genes, those are there to, uh, to replace, um, are replaced with the therapeutic transgene. So what we do is we take the rep and the cap out and we put the therapeutic transgene in. And then those regulatory elements help to control which cells will use the gene and how much of the treatment those cells will make. And so what happens is, is we're not actually having a capsid and then taking out its own genetic code and putting ours in. What we're doing is we're putting all of these different gene products into cells that then can create these capsids with the therapeutic transgene inside. So the capsid gene the, the virus gene that was inside that, pro, uh, that capsid is never actually in the um, AAV gene therapy. Okay, so as we noted a few minutes ago, one way that you can stop a protein from being made is to interfere with the RNA. So remember, we go from the DNA to the RNA to a protein. And so if we interfere with the RNA, you can't make the protein. So microRNAs are naturally made by cells to help them break down the RNA before it makes protein. And a gene therapy that can deliver microRNAs that target the HTT RNA, so the HTT is the gene uh, for the Huntington protein, which is what is the problem with Huntington's disease. Um, so then therefore you'll have less of that HTT protein. So less of that will be produced because the microRNA actually breaks down the RNA or that code for making the protein before the protein is made. And what studies have shown is that reducing both the normal and the abnormal HTT RNA is effective treatment strategy in animal models of Huntington's disease. So you can see here in the pictures, we're just going through the same thing. We have the CAG repeats that creates the HTT RNA and then the micro RNA that is going to interfere with that. So we have less of the protein and then our healthier neurons potentially at the end. So how do you get these transgenes to cells? So as we said earlier, we're gonna package those in an AAV and we, once the AAV enters a cell, it takes the transgene and it brings it into the nucleus of the cell. And then those two ITRs, those two elements that are at the end of the transgene, attach to each other and make a loop that's called an episome. And this episome is separate from the genes of the cell. So 
this is the cell's DNA and this is the episome here. And you can see that while it's inside the nucleus, it's not inside the cell's DNA. And then this new episome may be used by the cell to make a new treatment. So it can take then the transgene that was inside that AAV and it's now going to, in this instance, make that microRNA that will go outside the nucleus and interfere with the RNA. It's interfering with the RNA or an RNAi, and therefore the protein isn't being made. So how do we get from all of these pieces to a potential therapy for HD? Well, what we do is we design the transgenes and test them for accuracy, safety, and potency. We start this in cells, and then we do it in animal models. There are a number of mouse models that have um, attributes that are similar to HD disease. And we test them there, and we take the ones that have the greatest potency while still showing safety. After they're then packaged into the AAVs, we then use those to test them in other animals, again, to find out which ones are the most safe and most efficacious in those animal models so that we can select the right ones to then potentially test in people who have HD. So because these AAVs can't cross the blood-brain barrier, We'll, we will be delivering these um, vectors directly into the brain. So this is very similar again to the um, way that the Unicure therapy is being delivered right now. And we deliver this to, um, so that it can get directly to where the cells are that it needs to treat. So there are multiple areas of the brain that are important to target to treat Huntington's disease. And I have some of them highlighted here. The putamen, which is where motor coordination and involuntary movements are controlled. The caudate nucleus, where we have emotional and behavioral control and also learning and memory. And then the cerebral cortex, where behavior, mood disturbance and motor impairment cells are. So one of the things that we've learned is that these AAV vectors can travel using connections between key structures in the brain. And so we propose that delivering the therapy to the putamen and the thalamus will not only be able to treat those structures, but will be able then to use those networks within the brain to travel to the caudate and up into the cortex so that we can treat all of the areas of the brain that are important for HD. So what happens between the lab and the clinic? So once we have the potential gene therapy, it has to be thoroughly tested before it can be given to people. Um, we need to know if the therapy is likely to work as expected. Um, we need to know that the therapy is likely to have an impact on the disease and if the therapy is likely to be safe and can be safely administered. We also need to find out whether the possible side effects that could occur in people and that the therapy be, can be consistently produced and at high quality. We take all of this information that we've learned as we've developed the drug and we presented it to the FDA, we present it to the Food and Drug Administration, and we also would present it to other um, regulatory agencies outside of the United States, such as the EMA. And then they decide if the potential therapy will be cleared for testing and clinical trials in humans, called the first in human trials, by granting it the investigational new drug status. Without that grant of the investigational new drug status, we can't test the therapy in um, people with HD. And so with that, I'll stop and open to any questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fine. That was a really good talk. And I like how you broke down all the scientific jargon and the research that goes behind, you know, a potential new therapy. So I think uh, we can start off with questions. I think we already have one. Um, so they ask, how many uh, AAVs are implanted at a time? And also, is there a risk that the AAVs could over-replicate? Thanks. So... The number of AAVs that are implanted at a time, it's a single type of AAV, so it's a single serotype. 
Um, and it's called, the way we count them is called vector genomes. And we don't yet know for our uh, therapy how many vector genomes we will be administering for a single dose. But one of the things um, that we'll be doing in phase one trials, and is if you were in Unicure's presentation, they also talked about this, is we'll be, develop, we'll be delivering different doses of the vectors as we go from a lower dose cohort up into a higher dose cohort, because one of the things that you're trying to do in a phase one clinical trial is to better understand what the best dose is in terms of the safety and the tolerability, and then whether or not you're seeing any evidence of clinical benefit. Got it. So I really like this next question from Dr. Bonnie. She asks if uh, you think one therapy will be better versus another for HD? Or do you feel all the therapies highlighted? We've talked about Unicure, there's the Roche and a couple of new ones coming out as, or like in clinical studies as well. Do you think these can be used in conjunction with each other? I think this is a pretty relevant question for companies like Unicure and Voyager, because I think the aim is to be, you know, a one-time thing, right? That's correct. So I think that we don't know um, is the answer to your question. You know, what's important is that we are, as a community, looking at so many different strategies and having so many different potential therapies coming to, to market to help people with HD, I think is extraordinarily exciting. And I think that, you know, one of the things we know is that when we're, as we're working in these earlier phase clinical trials, and even probably as we get to completed clinical trials and into the market, these therapies will be tested as what are called monotherapy. So they'll be tested alone without any other therapies on board. And whether or not they can be used in conjunction is a really important research question that we hope the community will continue to investigate as these therapies mature and as new therapies come to market. But that just like these therapies as monotherapies have to be tested very carefully to make sure that they are safe and potentially effective, we would have to do the same thing with combination therapies. Got it. Um, let's wait a minute to see if any other questions come in, but I have a question. Sure. So what's the rationale between targeting the thalamus and the striatum? And why not do it like in the reverse? Why not go for the cortex? Because I would imagine that would be safer, no? So, we target the putamen primarily because that's the motor um, system, right? And we want to make sure that we get enough of those vector genomes where we need the biggest effect. The, the cortex is the whole outer shell of the brain, right? And so targeting the cortex is a little bit different than targeting one of the smaller areas of the brain where we can really look and see you know, with the, the interoperative MRI, which again, Unicure spoke about earlier, and we have been using for a number of years in our Parkinson's disease program, you can actually watch and see um, where the, the vector goes during the administration. So we, uh, in our Parkinson's disease program, it's co-administered with what's called um, getaterodol, which is a um, agent that allows the MRI to sort of watch it as it, as it moves through, through your system. So it's called an imaging agent. And um, in our Parkinson's disease program, we co-administered our therapy with the getaterodol and so we could watch that. And so we've chosen these other um, parts of the brain because we wanna make sure that we are really targeting those specific areas, but then also taking advantage of the fact that the vector can move to other places in the brain and have the impact, but that the greatest impact will be where it's administered. Yeah, got it. Right, I think there are no other questions. So maybe I can ask uh, a really big picture question then. Sure. Or in terms of timelines, when do you think you guys will be moving into the clinic or like in phase one studies? You're still waiting for your FDA approval, right? That's exactly right. And yeah. so, you know, as I said, we're working very hard to respond to the FDA. We um, 
You know, we've got a number of questions from them all on our CMC, our chemistry manufacturing and control, and we are working to answer those questions. And then um, once we have submitted our answers to the agency's questions, they then have 30 days to review our filing again and review our response to the answers. And so within that 30 days, they will either come back to us and say, we have additional questions or we will have clearance to move forward with our phase one trial. Got it. All right. I think that's all. I don't see any more questions. Thank you, Dr. Fine, for the wonderful talk. And it's great to see all these different types of therapies coming through. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank right. you, everyone. Yeah. Um, for everyone, there's a couple of talks coming up next. So if you stick with track one, we have an exciting update by PDC. who we'll use a small molecule or an oral drug to target Huntington's disease. And on track two, I think um, there's a session about testing positive for hunting disease. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fine again. Thank you. A pleasure having you.